Right, that's Ooh. better. Right. Uh, we, we can see you now. Oh, great. Uh, I, I think we'll have to... Okay, I, I can see you also in the room. Right. Can you still hear? You can still hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah. yes. okay, great. Um, I'm told that uh, perhaps you'll have to move the PowerPoint uh, manually. So in theory, I could have done it from here, but... Uh, uh, I've, I've, I've got the lecture slides up here just now, so I can just move them. All right, so very good. So you, you are on the introduction, the first uh, page with my name. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yes, all right. Okay, so let's start. I'll, I'm, I'll just close the door. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in a small room, conference room. Okay, so, well, I'm uh, sorry for the delay. I'm told that it's because of uh, the technical uh, system in Glasgow, not because of ours here. <laughs> this is what... This is what our technicians here are, are telling me. They're, they're saying that, oh, well, yeah, we have a great system, but the one in Glasgow seems a little bit old. <laughs> <laughs> Probably it's not, that's not the, 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 the issue. Okay, so you can uh, move on to the, the next slide. Uh, so this is, just as an introduction, I'll give you the outline uh, a little bit uh, later. Um, it, it's clear that the financial crisis has had an impact uh, on a number of people, certainly has had an impact on students of economics who see things uh, differently perhaps than students before 2008 uh, would look at economics. Uh, it has had an impact on some journalists, uh, has had an impact on trade unions. Trade unions are now, uh, well, at least some of them, uh, wondering uh, whether all these things they have been talked about, like the, the natural rate of unemployment, do, do these things really uh, exist? Central bankers had to uh, revise their view. I would say, to some extent, the IMF has initially done a, a U-turn, then went back to its uh, standard austerity policies, and now is somewhere half in between uh, those two. So uh, all these uh, people have somewhat changed their view of looking at economics, but uh, looking at the next slide, uh, I think we can say that the European Commission has, uh, has not changed its views. And I think it's fair to say that um, most economics professors uh, have not changed their views uh, either. I mean, if I think about my own departments, I don't think much has changed. Uh, it is true that there are some people, uh, some of my colleagues uh, in other uh, universities who, uh, have, uh, who have changed somewhat uh, their views. I have in mind a colleague who is at McGill University who has uh, created last year a course on financial crisis, asking the students to read uh, books uh, by John Kenneth Galbraith, for instance, uh, The Big Crash, or, uh, or a book by, uh, or articles by uh, Minsky, for instance. So there is a little change, uh, but not much change uh, going on. And uh, if you move on to the next slide, here I have a, a quote by Willem Boiter, which was written in 2009. Boiter is a well-known uh, professor. He was also a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. And as you can see here uh, with this statement, he certainly doesn't think much of uh, what is being taught in graduate programs uh, across uh, North America. Uh, he thinks it has been, uh, the last 30 years have, have been a big waste of, my, uh, of time and that uh, economics is not something that keeps progressing uh, always to the better, but uh, in fact that the last 30 years uh, have been uh, going in the wrong direction. We're not improving macroeconomics. So moving to the next slide. 
uh, where could we go? And I, I think your uh, organization is, is certainly on the right track. Uh, we've got to find some way of changing uh, how economics is uh, being taught in economics departments. Uh, there's got to be more opening to dissent, well, both within uh, the mainstream and outside of the mainstream. Uh, I think there's got to be less emphasis on techniques, uh, more emphasis on institutions, on the, the history of economic thought, on the history on economic history. Uh, I certainly have nothing against uh, econometrics. I, I think it's a, it's a useful tool, but you know everybody cannot do mathematical economics or econometrics. And I, I think that, uh, so we need to change the curriculum. And despite what students may think, I think, uh, I believe that students are the biggest uh, the, the biggest, uh, the, 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 st the strongest element to change the curriculum in the sense that, you know, it, it's unlikely that professors on their own will do it. It's students that must put the pressure on, on, uh, on the departments to, uh, to change what is uh, being taught in economics departments. Okay, so next slide. Uh, this was by way of introduction, so what is the outline of what I'm going to present? It's going to be divided into three parts. Uh, first, I'm going to try to explain what, in my view, how, in my view, we can distinguish between heterodox economics and orthodox economics. So th th those are the, the two names I will be uh, using. Secondly, I'll speak about one sort of heterodox economics, one brand of heterodox economics that I know best, which is post-Keynesian economics. And third, uh, I'll ask this question, why is it that uh, it seems that there's a lot of empirical results that give support to neoclassical theory? Uh, so how can that be when it seems that uh, many of the assumptions of neoclassical theory are not correct uh, or completely unrealistic. So those are the three parts. I, I'm, I'm not. If if I cannot get to the third part, too bad. But so we'll see. How, how much time? I'll, I mean, now I see it's uh, 12 past. Uh, until when should I speak? And how much time do you want for questions? Uh, I don't. Maybe. What? Yeah, maybe until like uh, seven o'clock. So that would be what three and right. at your end. Okay. I okay. That, and, or maybe maybe a little bit long, or maybe a little bit longer, and then we'll have well, questions, and then hmm. then we'll we'll have to be out of here by uh, half half three. So. Okay. Mm. Okay. So I'll I'll talk for about another forty-five minutes. Okay, that'll be great. Okay. So, uh, next uh, slide, and uh, so that's the first part, and so you have to go another slide, and here I have listed all the names which have been given in the past to either what I consider to be heterodox economics or orthodox economics. So, uh, if we look at the heterodox side, in the past, myself, I used to talk about non-orthodox economics, but over the last, uh, I would say, 15 years, heterodox economics is the term that has been used. In my book in 1992, I was talking about a post-classical economics because I was trying to uh, have a, the counter to neoclassical economics. And then there are other words. Radical political economy has been used by Malcolm Sawyer from Leeds University. Real world economics uh, has become popular. And uh, even more recently, uh, Fulbrook has used the term new paradigm economics. So then on the other side, on the orthodox side, that you know that's what we usually call the mainstream or the dominant paradigm or neoclassical economics, 
to some extent you can also say marginalism and Fulbrook has used the term old paradigm economics. So some people, some of my colleagues who are more into methodology try to make distinctions between neoclassical economics, the mainstream and all that, but uh, I'm, I'm not really convinced that uh, the dominant paradigm or the mainstream is not neoclassical economics anymore. Uh, I think that we can use all these terms as synonyms. Uh, next slide. So who are these uh, heterodox schools in, in economics? And there's a lot of them. Uh, some of them are smaller schools. Uh, others have a large mem membership. Um, I've put the post-Keynesians and the Strathians uh, first because this is basically what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but I, I would say that the two biggest uh, schools in terms of numbers right now are the institutionalist or what we call the old institutionalist to differentiate them from say neoclassical institutionalist and then the second one is the Marxist which uh, since the 1990s prefer to be called radicals uh, although uh, with the crisis in 2007-2008, uh, Marx, Marxism is much more popular than it was both for econo in economics, in sociology, in political science, and so on. So there's a return, there's a comeback of Marxism uh, in different uh, departments. Uh, then there are others, I mentioned development structuralists who mainly come from Latin America. Uh, in France, they have the French Regulation School, which is a mixture of Keynesian, Keynesianism and uh, Marxism. Uh, the French also have a school called the School of Conventions. Uh, circuit theory uh, was uh, something that came out of France, came out of, uh, of Italy as well. And uh, then other uh, groups like fem feminist economics also has uh, the same basis, I would say, as the other these other uh, heterodox schools. Uh, ecological economics is also a part of heterodox economics, and uh, in fact. I mean, I, I've written just a little bit about uh, this, and uh, I've argued that ecological economics and also feminist economics has the same, what I call, presuppositions. And there are many others. You you can see down on the uh, on the PowerPoint. You even have Gandhi economics, uh, Gazelle economics. And then there's the question about what about neo-Austrians, the Austrians, neo-Austrians, are they heterodox? Usually they call themselves heterodox economists, but I've put a question mark because I'm, I'm not really convinced that they should be put in the same grouping as the other heterodox uh, schools. And also with the financial crisis, neo-Austrians have also become uh, highly fashionable uh, on, on the web. They are very uh, active. Okay, so we can move to uh, the next slide. And here uh, I am uh, trying to <coughs> picture a little bit what, how it looks like in macroeconomics. So I'm not talking about microeconomics, but this is only macroeconomics. So on the right hand side, I've put the neoclassical school. On the left hand side, I've put the heter heterodox uh, schools. I think it, it represents to a large extent uh, the political views of these two groups of authors. And Keynes is somehow in the center because Keynes has had influence uh, both on what we could call uh, the old Keynesians and the new Keynesians. And it has had an influence on the heterodox side, uh, the post Keynesians certainly well, that's why they call themselves post-Keynesians, have been influenced heavily by Keynes, just like 
the, the old Keynesians, people like Paul Samuelson, James Tobin, uh, Robert Solo, were, were also influenced by <coughs> Keynes. Um, so, uh, right, Ke as you know, Keynes was in Cambridge. So the, his first followers uh, were from Cambridge, so they were called Cambridge Keynesians, and that gave rise to the post-Keynesians. Then you also had among the other uh, heterodox authors who also do a lot of macroeconomics are the Marxist authors or the radicals. Uh, so they were much less uh, influenced by Keynes, but when you look at the new the, the, if you want the, the, the latest generation of Marxists, which in the U.S. call themselves radicals, and in <coughs> France, uh, I mean, their perhaps most active representatives in macroeconomics is the French regulation school. Uh, those newer Marxists, so to speak, are being influenced both by Marx, as I was saying before, and also by the Cambridge Keynesians. There's, there's a lot of relationship. Uh, I mean, the kind of work that they were doing uh, looked very much like what the, uh, the Cambridge Keynesians uh, were doing. So uh, that's the, the picture uh, for macroeconomics. And then, of course, uh, you know, you also had on the mainstream side, the neoclassical side, you had uh, the monetarists and now what is called the new key classicals. And I don't know if you can see down here, there's a little line, that uh, dotted line that puts together the new Keynesians and the new classicals. It's because uh, today there is a model that puts together the ideas of both schools, which is called the new consensus. Mm. Right, so we can move to the, uh, the other slide. Um, which I think is important. So you have these nice uh, colors. Uh, I try to, I mean, as I said, there are some people, methodologists uh, of economics, who say that, well, we cannot speak of the neoclassical school anymore. Lots of things have changed on that side of economics. There, there's lots of people who have some dissent with the standard model in neoclassical economics. Mm -hmm. So, um, following uh, the idea of another methodologist, uh, I think it's fair to say that we, in fact, we should be using uh, three categories. Uh, you have dissenters, people who dissent with the mainstream ideas, the, the mainstream ideas being those that you can find in textbooks, either undergraduate textbooks or graduate textbooks. And uh, these dissenters can be either heterodox economists who uh, will have these um, characteristics that I will outline in a few minutes, or they can be orthodox <coughs> economists who dissent with the dominant view within <coughs> orthodox economy, eco economics. So this is why, if you look here, you can see the dissenters can be either heterodox in red or can be in this different green color here, part of the orthodoxy, but they dissent from <coughs> the mainstream. And I think that makes it easier to understand uh, all these debates that we have uh, currently in economics. And if we move to the next slide, we here have the names of some examples of orthodox dissenters. Here I have lined up uh, only uh, well-known ones. Uh, most of them, uh, in fact, I think uh, all of them except Keynes uh, got uh, a Nobel Prize. So those, uh, these authors were uh, dissenters um, in, in their time or are still dissenters, uh, but in my view, uh, they are part of the orthodoxy. They, they, have, they start with from the same assumptions as those of their more mainstream uh, colleagues. Milton Friedman back in the 1950s was considered to be uh, something, somebody very bizarre 
he was <coughs> you know he was truly not part of the mainstream his ideas was were considered to be uh, the Americans say considered to be in the left field because in baseball when you play in the left field you never get any balls being batted in your direction uh, so Friedman although he was completely to the right on the political uh, stand, was considered to be a, in the left field when it came to uh, ideas. Uh, Paul Krugman also, I think, who would be considered as a dissenter because most of his colleagues, uh, neoclassical colleagues, would not agree with uh, all the blogs that he writes for the New York Times. Uh, William Vickery was, uh, got the Nobel Prize. Uh, unfortunately, he died the next day uh, as he was driving to give uh, a conference. Uh, he had a heart attack. Uh, and it's very unfortunate indeed because in the last five uh, or ten years of his life, he had become a post-Keynesian economist. But of course, he got the Nobel Prize for his previous neoclassical work. Herbert Simon is also uh, a good example. I think he <coughs> initially was certainly considered to be part of uh, the orthodoxy, uh, but in his later years he, uh, he was a total dissenter, and I would put him among the heterodox. Okay, we can move to the next slide. What do these uh, heterodox schools that I mentioned before, what do they have in, uh, in common? Uh, well, first, we, we might say that there seems to be a lot of schools, uh, in part the reason being that different schools of thought among these heterodox people focus on different fields. So to some extent, they seem to be different, um, but it's, it's mainly because they are interested in different uh, issues. But in my view, uh, all these schools have many things in common, and these things are called presuppositions by the philosophers of science. And in the next slide, I will mention five of these presuppositions, uh, w which are things that cannot be questioned. You, you, either it's there in the in your in the background, or uh, it is something that you, um, as I said, that you don't try to question. You just take it as a given. So, next slide. What are these five presuppositions? So I have lined them up, five of them, and I, I give the heterodox school presupposition, which corresponds, say, to method, and then on the other side, uh, what I think is the uh, method of the orthodox schools. Now, I should say that four of these five presuppositions I've, uh, I've put down uh, already about uh, 25 years ago. It was around 1989 or 1990. I was asked to make a presentation at a department of philosophy <laughs> uh, where they had a group working on the philosophy of science, and they asked me to uh, present to them what is post-Keynesian economics. So I wrote a long paper. Uh, philosophers, uh, I'm sure, liked it, liked it because it was very long, uh, about 40 pages. So I made the presentation, and then I was asked after the presentation to write a short four-page summary for their bulletin. So uh, I I. I found it was very hard in four pages to summarize, well, what is post-Keynesian economics? But on the other hand, I thought, well, I, it seems to me there are those four features which uh, identify pretty well uh, everything about heterodox schools that heterodox schools have in common. <coughs> and so. Um, if, if we look at the heterodox school, I would argue that realism is an important uh, presupposition. Uh, holism or organicism, which is versus the other side, which is atomism, atomicism uh, would be uh, the second one. Then about rationality, I would argue that 
Polsky Indians and heter the other heterodox schools have a reasonable rationality or what some people call an ecological rationality whereas it seems to me that the neoclassicals in their models always start with some uh, hyper rationality and then what is the economic core uh, of heterodox schools and I would say well it basically it's tried to explain production and how uh, the economy can grow and it's based on income effects whereas on the other side if we look at neoclassical theory or the mainstream uh, scarcity is the crucial thing and then recently I have added this fifth presupposition um, which is more on the political side uh, I, I think it's clear that heterodox economists believe that uh, markets need to be tamed. You cannot just leave them uh, working on their own. Uh, they are too unstable. Whereas on the other side, in, orth most orthodox authors would believe that, well, if, you, if prices are sufficiently flexible, then you will always be in the best of all possible worlds. So, uh, let me uh, go over these five presuppositions. I will have one slide per uh, presupposition. The one about method, uh, so holism, organicism, I will do last because this is probably, uh, I have more to say about that. And I'll go very quickly on uh, the other four. So, uh, next slide. Uh, if we look at neoclassical theory or orthodox theory, we have statements such as those of uh, Robert Lucas, 1981, who got the Nobel Prize, who says, good models have to necessarily be artificial, abstract, patently unreal. So this is exactly what Milton Friedman, his former colleague uh, at the University of Chicago, uh, was uh, also saying, you know, the, the more unreal the model is the better or the more unreal I should say the assumptions are the starting assumptions are the better so uh, one way to summarize this is the the fourth uh, point on this slide which is it is better to be precisely wrong than roughly right uh, I think this is how mainstream economists uh, view economics uh, on the bottom there, I have an example, um, but, uh, well, th th there was a, a function which was being used by uh, mathematical technicians in finance to compute what the price of collateralized debt obligations ought to be, and this was based on an index of credit default swaps. Uh, so. So it was based on something that was uh, the result of a market mechanism instead of looking at the true default rates as they could be observed. So I would say that's a good example of instrumentalism. Okay, uh, next one is rationality. Well, uh, you know, the, the economy... The, the mainstream economists want to make us believe that if you don't think like an economist, then you are irrational. So that's the basic uh, starting point. Uh, and then you have all these things such as uh, rational expectations and macroeconomic models. Uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't think it makes uh, any sense. It didn't make any sense when this was introduced uh, when I was a young professor in the very late 1970s or 1980s, and I don't, I don't think uh, it is uh, any more valid now. And here I have a statement by Philip Mirowski, who is a specialist of uh, methodology uh, of science, who says just that. Okay, uh, and as Gerd Gigerenzer is a psychologist, 
a very interesting one. And if you're interested in behavioral economics, uh, psychology and economics, I really recommend uh, reading him. He's got many books, many papers, many of them available for free on the internet. And he says, a systematic deviation from an insane standard, the insane standard being thinking as economists or mainstream economists would like us to, to do, should not automatically be called a judgmental error. So this is, at the same time, a critic criticism of new behavioral economics. Okay, scarcity versus production. This is probably uh, easier. You've all heard what the definition of economics is in your very first year uh, class in economics. You were told that economics is the study of scarcity. Uh, I asked my students in my fourth year class in September, what is um, economics? And uh, one of them gave me a very funny uh, answer. Uh, saying that neoclassical economics is the study of an upward sloping supply, supply curve with a downward sloping demand curve. <laughs> I thought this was very funny, but to some extent, I guess this is uh, probably the impression you get as well. Uh, so this is the view of mainstream economics. On the other side, you have the heterodox view, and here I have a definition from John Weeks, who teaches at uh, SOAS, the School of Oriental and Asian Studies in uh, London. And I, I like his definition. Uh, I like it very much. Uh, economics is the study of the process by which society brings its available resources into production and the distribution of that production among its members. So it introduces production. That's the main issue. And then you've got another one, which is, well, how do you distribute that? And scarcity does not enter, at least directly, into this uh, definition. So I think that's uh, another thing that differentiates heterodox from orthodoxy. Uh, the political side, uh, uh, you, uh, which is related to uh, markets, free markets, as uh, people from the right like to call them, or unfettered markets, as we prefer to call them. And here we have this statement by Keynes, 1934, so we were still in the midst of the Great Depression. And Keynes is very clear about how he divides the two groups of economists. On the one side are those who believe that the... Have you changed the... Uh, <laughs> do you yeah, have the yeah. proper... Yeah, sorry, okay. On the one side are those who believe that the existing economic system is, in the long run, a self-adjusting system, though with creaks and groans and jerks and interrupted by time lags, outside interference mistakes. So this is exactly the description of New Keynesians today. This is exactly what they would be saying. On the other side of the gulf are those that reject the idea that the existing economic system is, in any significant sense, self-adjusting, and I would say that this is fairly well a uh, good representation of what is modern heterodox macroeconomics today. Okay, next slide. So uh, maybe this is uh, one that I find very interesting, and I hope you, you will too, uh, which is that one cannot do macroeconomics just by starting from the single individual. You cannot say that what is true for an individual is necessarily true for the whole society. So th those are what we call macro paradoxes. Sometimes it's called errors of composition. And uh, the best known one is the very first one, the paradox of thrift identified by Keynes in the General Theory 1936, which says that, well, if you have a higher saving, uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to have higher investment. And in fact, it means that you're likely to have lower output. So that's the first paradox, the paradox of thrift. And I've, I've taught first year a couple of years ago. And I found out, looking at all the textbooks, that the paradox of thrift is not even in textbooks anymore in first year. 
but during the financial crisis, it was certainly an issue. I mean, on the one hand, you had all these households which were in debt, and on the other hand, uh, you did not want all the households to start saving, otherwise uh, consumption would go down and the economic activity would be going down. And there's a whole list of other paradox, uh, paradox of costs, uh, identified by, in particular, Bob Rothorn at Cambridge in 1981, which says that if you have higher real wages, it may lead to higher profit rates and not, to, not necessarily to lower profit rates. If you're the only one, the only company that raises real wages uh, when nobody else is doing it, it's true that it's going to reduce your markup. It's likely to reduce your rate of profit. But if all firms together raise their real wages, uh, this is likely to lead to uh, higher profit rates. Um, and other paradoxes, uh, for instance, the paradox of liquidity, which was uh, mentioned by Sheila Dow, who used to teach at Stirling University in Scotland. And in, back in 1987, she was arguing that efforts to become more liquid would be transforming liquid assets into uh, illiquid ones. And this is exactly, again, what we observed during the, uh, during the, the financial crisis. The paradox of risk, uh, which was identified by a, a, a Minskian a follower of Minsky all back in 1980, uh, where you, you are being given, through all these credit default swaps, you are being given the, uh, the opportunity to protect yourself, and you think that you now have less risk, but in fact he was, Vojny Lower was arguing that this in, indeed would lead to more risk overall. And again, I would argue that this is exactly what happened during the financial crisis. And this is why it's important to, uh, to have this holistic understanding of economics, which you cannot get if you construct macroeconomic models built on micro foundations where you have a single representative agent. OK, and there are other paradoxes. Uh, which perhaps uh, if you can ask me uh, later because I see that I'm starting to run out of time. Uh, Edward Fulbrook, uh, in a recent uh, short paper, has identified, so that's the next slide, has identified uh, 10 presuppositions of the new paradigm, what, so heterodox economics. I listed them here, he's got 10 of them. And uh, five of them correspond to uh, the five that I have identified uh, previously. So he adds to this pluralism, believes that heterodox economists are more pl pluralistic. Perhaps, I'm not 100% uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, anyway, so I'll move on to uh, the next uh, slide, which where I try to sum, sum this up. So, um, so to sum up, what, all I want to say is that all these different schools of heterodox economics, they do have things in common. They can be distinguished from the, the way mainstream economists or orthodox ec economists uh, think. And, uh, of course, there are battles within heterodox economists. I mean, the Marxists don't have exactly the same opinions as the post-Keynesians on macroeconomic issues or monetary issues. But this is normal. I mean, even within mainstream economics, you also have battles of ideas uh, between the, the new Keynesians and the new classical. But I, I think there is a common ground between all these heterodox schools and of course that they should be introduced in universities. Okay, so next slide. I, I now move on to part two. I'll ha have to go a little bit uh, quicker. And I want to talk a bit about post-Keynesian economics uh, because this is what I have been uh, studying for the last 30 years or so. 
Uh, so next slide, you have the various, uh, you have a kind of history of post-Keynesian economics. I think we can say the beginning was when Keynes published the general theory in 1936. <laughs> Uh, then in the 1960s, there was this, uh, what is called the Cambridge Capital Controversies, uh, where perhaps for uh, about the only time, uh, neoclassical authors from MIT, for instance, uh, engage in a conversation and in a debate with you know, Cambridge economists, uh, people like John Robinson, Nicholas Caldor, uh, Sraffa, Garagnani, Pazinetti, um, and this was a very peculiar moment. Uh, but almost at the same time, the people in Cambridge, Cambridge Keynesians, and some uh, Keynesians in the United States realized that what they were doing was different uh, from the orthodox view, and in particular, uh, when monetarism came around, which was embraced uh, fully by the other orthodox economists, by central banks and all that, then the, came this realization that, oh, there exists a different school of thought, which was called Cambridge economics, uh, neo-Keynesian economics, and finally post-Keynesian economics. Then in the mid-1970s, 1980s, there was the belief that, well, perhaps neoclassical economics can be overcome. So this is why it's called the Romantic Age. Uh, and also, the, the, there were new journals that were created, organizations. And uh, so this was a kind of optimistic view at, at the time. And then in the 1990s, we had what we call the Age of Uncertainty, uh, which uh, I think was a bad turn that post keynesians took. There, I think there was too much talk about methodology. I have nothing against methodology. I've just spent 30 minutes talking about methodology. But you know, we, we certainly don't want a majority of students or professors working on that. I mean, we have to develop models, do empirical work, and so on. And finally, I think we have reached this stage uh, at the end of the 1990s, beginning of the 2000s. When you go to post-Keynesian conferences, uh, there is very little talk now about methodology. All the talk is about economic, well, empirical work or about policy implications, policy work. So I, I think this is uh, going in the uh, right direction. Okay, next slide. Uh, what is the link between post Keynesian economics and all, all that I have been talking? Well, I would argue that post Keynesians adopted the, these five general heterodox presuppositions that I've been talking about. Uh, there's no question about that. So, what's the difference between post Keynesian economics and the other heterodox schools? So, that's the next slide specific post-Keynesian presuppositions. Uh, I think the key feature of post-Keynesian economics is this concern with the principle of effective demand, or, or if you prefer, the, this concern with aggregate demand. Post-Keynesians believe that both in the short run and in the long run, it is aggregate demand or effective demand that drives the system. So, of course, there are some periods or in some countries it might be the case that the supply side will be the constraint or it may also be the case that it's the external side that is the constraint in the sense that you are the country is importing too many goods has a trade deficit current account deficit this is creating problems eventually but even that is a, a problem more from the point of view of aggregate demand than from the point of view of the supply side so uh, this is really uh, key, and key also to this idea is that you know, what drives the system is either the consumption by the households or the investment of firms. It is this that creates the saving that eventually finances the investment um, over, over the long run. So it's this causality which is very important that investment causes saving. 
And again, during the financial crisis, uh, you could see that neoclassical economists were very much embarrassed because their long-run models keep saying that you need to encourage saving for the economy to grow faster. But on the other hand, you didn't want everybody to s stop consuming so that the economic activity would fall at an even lower level. The second important presupposition or specific post-Keynesian presupposition, I think, is this idea of the irreversibility, I'll say it with a French accent, of time. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, what the post-Keynesians always emphasize is that we need to have a story or we need to have a, a modeling that explains how we move from the short run towards the long run. We just cannot assume that we are in this imaginary long run. We've got to provide a story, and this is called the traverse. So it's the path that gets you from, say, one equilibrium, a starting position, to the end position, which you may consider to be an equilibrium or not. So all these things like multiple equilibria, path dependence, are important for uh, post-Keynesians. Um, Kaleski keeps saying that there is no independent long-run trend, that this long-run trend is the result of the evolution of what happens in the short run. So this is quite in contrast with, uh, certainly with the, the mainstream view. Just think about the solo growth model that probably most of you have seen in first or second year. Uh, if you're asking me what's the difference with the Marxists, the Marxists usually believe that, just like the post-Keynesians, that aggregate demand is important and relevant in the short run. But Marxists usually would argue that over the long run, the supply side takes over. So that would be the difference between post-Keynesian and Marxist or radical macroeconomics. OK, we can move to the uh, next slide. In my introduction to post-Keynesian economics, I've you know, I've said, well, you also have other important features of post-Keynesian economics. Certainly, uh, for those of you who have been on blogs, you, you, you've seen that you know, there's a lot of talk about radical uncertainty or fundamental uncertainty that has to be distinguished from risk. Um, there's this emphasis that we are not in a barter economy, that money and credit are there from the very start, that this has to be introduced in, in models. Uh, institutions are important, and also alternative microeconomics. Just to give an example in the next slide, uh, here's an example of how post-Keynesians uh, see cost curves at the level of the firm. And so what you can see is that the marginal cost curve or the average variable cost curve is flat up to uh, full capacity. And it's only after that that marginal costs start to rise. And therefore, this means that unit costs fall up to this full capacity. Full capacity is what you normally produce if you were at full capacity if you were producing at 100% of what you can do. But of course, you can you know, produce more than that if you have over time, if you don't close the, the plants uh, or the company on Saturdays and Sundays. But in this case, you would be around here. You would be, so if what post Keynesians are saying is that, all right, all these upward sloping marginal cost curve, this is true, uh, but, but it's a, it's a, it's a special case. 95% of the time, uh, all the firms will be in this area, in the area where the average variable cost, or what we call direct unit costs, are flat. So this is a good example. And all the evidence shows that this is the case. Uh, you know, uh, there, there was a recent, well, recent. So there was a survey done by Alan Blinder when he was at the Fed where he asked 700 firms, you know, what is the shape of your cost curves, your average variable cost curve, 
and 90% uh, of the firms said, well, it's either flat or downward sloping, which is exactly the opposite of what you will find in textbooks. So this is also important when we talk about what's the impact of uh, higher economic activity and so on. Um, there are at least uh, five strands of post-Keynesians. Uh, I'm running out of time here, bad timing. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, uh, well, for instance, Sheila Dow, from Sterling University, I would put her in the fundamentalist or financial Keynesian side. The Giuseppe Fontana, who used to be the chair at the Department of Economics at Leeds University, I would also put him here. But Malcolm Sawyer, who was the chair before Fontana, I would put him among the Kaleskians. Uh, so you have these five groups. The institutionalists, perhaps some of you have heard about uh, modern monetary theory, MMT. Uh, with Randall Ray in particular. So I would put this group uh, with the institutionalists, meaning that they are very, they, they study institutions very closely to know better how the economy is functioning. And in particular, John Kenneth Galbraith and his son, uh, James Galbraith, that's why I put two X here, uh, would also be part of these institutionalist post Keynesians. Uh, my former uh, co-author, Wynne Godley, I would put him uh, in the Caldorians. Okay, and then I say some authors go across the various strands. Uh, I would put myself in that last group here, meaning that I think, you know, I appreciate all the work which is being done by these five strands. Okay, next uh, slide. Uh, so I'm going to try to say, I mean, who's afraid of neoclassical economics? So um, it's like, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Uh, or why do neoclassical theories always seem to be supported by empirical evidence? Uh, so let's jump a, a couple of slides. Uh, let, let me say, okay. Um, Okay, here, are you on the another theoretical construct? Yep. Yeah, okay, so, well, post-Keynesians post reject the idea of this neoclassical production function which is well-behaved with a first derivative which, which is positive, second derivative which is negative. There, that's par part of the Capital Cambridge controversies. I mean, if you, let's go to the next slide. Cambridge, UK versus Cambridge, Massachusetts, because MIT is in a city called Cambridge, which is on the other side of the river from Boston. And usually, if you are a neoclassical economist, you believe that the labor demand curve is downward sloping if you have the real wage rate on the vertical axis and labor on the horizontal axis. But what was shown during the controversies is that if you take a model with fixed coefficients, fixed technical coefficients, a kind of Leontief model, and if you uh, change the technology in a continuous way, well, you can either obtain a labor demand curve that has this shape, or you could obtain a labor demand curve that has this other shape. So the standard shape, which is assumed in neoclassical theory, is, is the result of a very specific model. Uh, as soon as you go below, beyond two uh, sectors, uh, this labor demand curve does not necessarily have the shape which is assumed in standard economics. Uh, what was the, so the next slide, what was the response of neoclassical econo economists to this? Well, one response was, I have faith. So that was one response, but that didn't look too good. So the next response was to say, well, when we do regressions on the neoclassical production function, the cup douglas production function, if we do it properly, it works. You know, we get a high correlation coefficient, and it seems to work. 
so um, the response to that is that in reality it seems to work but this is because uh, if you take a cup Douglas production function and you differentiate it it uh, the, the the mathematical equation that comes out of that is not much different from taking the national accounts and differentiating the national accounts through time and most th there's a there's a book that has recently been written by Jesus Felipe and John McCombie McCombie is at the University of Cambridge the book is called not even wrong uh, so it, meaning that neoclassical theory and pr the production function is so wrong that you, you know you can't even say it's wrong so uh, because it is so wrong and uh, John McCombie in a paper in 2001 did a little experiment he uh, he, he said okay let's assume that uh, the output elasticity of labor so you know this alpha coefficient in the Cobb Douglas production function let's assume it's equal to 0 0.75 um, so that's the the uh, coefficient for labor and then le let's assume that the share of uh, labor in national income is 0 0.25 and let's have a markup on that the pricing equation and uh, so then you get prices you get values and then you get you deflate the values in order to be able to do the regression on labor and the capital stock and what he found is that the coefficients that you get by making the regressions are the coefficients which are related to the labor share and the capital share and the, the coefficients that you will get have nothing to do with the output elasticities that you had assumed to start with so this is a, a demonstration by uh, Ad Absurdo uh, that you know what all these regressions are doing they are not computing output elasticities they are computing wage the wage share or the labor share and the capital share and I, I you know I highly recommend the book uh, to you and I explained that to my colleagues uh, in a workshop once uh, five or six years ago and the response of my colleagues was well I, I have to keep doing what I'm doing because otherwise I, I, I will not be able to do anything so this is what I was telling you at the very beginning what's important for mainstream economics is to be very precise it doesn't matter whether it's wrong what counts is to be very precise uh, I think I had a, a couple of other things okay maybe one more thing uh, go to the, the next slide further issues publication bias so do you, you get to this slide the yep got it publication. right so I'll, I'll stop with this I'll just say that uh, you know the, the another reason why neoclassical economics always seems to come out so well in empirical studies is publication bias there's a lot of what is called data fishing data uh, messaging data mining and the best example of that is this paper by Reinhardt and Rogoff that you know was published in the American Economic Review in 2010 where they showed in that paper that if the debt public debt to, to GDP ratio was about was above 90 percent then this was generating uh, rates of growth that were around zero percent for the economies with such high <laughs> debt ratios whereas for the other countries it was more like 2.5 now uh, the, I mean it, it became a scandal because last year a uh, couple of students with their professor uh, Robert Polin and the paper is now published in the Cambridge Journal of Economics 2014 they found they got all the original data they found coding mistakes omitted entries and uh, a very s funny way in which all the countries were being weighted and 
by redoing it in a proper way, they found that the rate of growth of these countries was approximately 2.2%, just slightly or almost identical to the rate of growth of the countries that had uh, um, a public debt to deficit to a public debt to GDP ratio that was above uh, below 90 percent. Uh, and by the way, uh, when they sent the paper to the American Economic Review, the American Economic Review said, well, no, we don't publish papers responding to uh, papers published in the papers in proceedings of the American Economic Review. Um, so uh, I, I would say that uh, there's a lot of work being done to, uh, to, to see uh, whether there is bias in the research which is uh, published. In particular, this fellow here, Tom Stanley, has uh, done many papers looking at that, and in, indeed he has found that there is severe uh, bias in at least half of the fields in economics, meaning that only results that seem to give a certain support to certain views uh, get published. So that would explain why, although neoclassical economics, in my view, is, n is completely unrealistic, uh, this explains a little bit why uh, empirical studies would seem to always confirm what uh, you know, some some views of neoclassical economics, for instance, the view that uh, if you raise real wages, this will diminish employment. Well, now there's more controversy about that uh, over the last 10 years, uh, but uh, that's a that's one of the fields where there is a lot of publication bias. So I'll stop here. And thank you for uh, listening to me. And now I'm going to listen to you and your questions. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, we've, we've got a, a microphone here, which I'm just going to try and switch on and pass around. If so, OK, we'll just take about five questions. Yeah. And we'll, we'll just say the questions first, yeah? Sure. yeah. Does anybody have any questions? <coughs> Thank you, for P Professor, for your interesting speech uh, talk. Uh, I've got a one quick question. Is, do the post Keynes, because I'm kind of new to post Keynesianism, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself a post Keynesian, but uh, is there a, a kind of explicit theory of value uh, that the post Keynesians stick to? Because I know Mar the Marxist would, would adhere to a kind of labour theory of value. Is that the. Um, position taken by the post Keynesian as well. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Uh, shall we? Yeah, shall we? We'll, we'll, maybe, we'll maybe just collect a few questions. I. Yeah. OK. And that one's meant to be better. Can you hear everything? Did, did, did you hear that question? I, I yeah. heard it very well, yes. Okay. Right. So you want, do, do you want to have uh, three or four questions in a row? Do you want me to uh, yeah, yeah. answer we'll, we'll each? Yeah. We'll, we'll just collect a few more. Um, anyone? All right. Alberto. Oh, this is not a student. <laughs> no, one question on um, econometrics. Um, you have suggested that um, post Keynesians should engage with econometrics, and uh, I wonder why. Um, fundamental uncertainty means that uh, events do not have probability distributions, uh, so I'm not so sure why we think that um, engaging with econometrics would present evidence that is in any way compelling. Yeah, okay. Good question. Um, you mentioned a whole series of paradoxes, but one commonality seemed to be that um, they reflected fallacies of composition. Is that yes. a fair comment? 
Yes. Well, I, I did say that that those paradoxes are also called sometimes uh, fallacies of composition. Yes, you're right. Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, in, in the first uh, section, you uh, sort of gave us a little quote by, uh, I think, Mr. Week. Uh, it was new. It said that they uh, that it didn't like mention scarcity explicitly, but uh, I picked up there was the words so like the available resources. It said so. I mean, uh, that probably implies scarcity, doesn't it? In like even within the new uh, post-Keynesian framework. What is like you know the role of scarcity? Okay. Hi there. Uh, you initially said that uh, the post-Keynesian economists they support the idea that consumption and investment both are compulsory for growth for production. Uh, but at the end, uh, you also said that they are against the Cobb Douglas production function, which is uh, output. Uh, is equal to capital accumulation and uh, labor, if not wrong. Uh, so uh, investment eventually leads to capital accumulation according to this function. So aren't these ideas contradictory that both kingdoms are one side supporting investment for growth and then they are uh, discarding this uh, production function? I'm just going to ask one question. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm guessing I need to turn this way. Uh, so I think uh, it's, it's normal that crashes, everybody sort of agrees that uh, these e economic crises are part of the, the capitalist system and these crises have been occurring for, I don't know, the past two, maybe three centuries, maybe two centuries. Um, what makes this crisis so different? And if there are these obstacles in, uh, in integrating post-Keynesian ideas, what will ever make them mainstream, if, if that makes sense? Um, have answers yeah. to, the, to that then just now. Right, right okay. Well, thank you uh, for these uh, very interesting uh, questions. Uh, yes, is there a theory of value in post uh, Keynesian economics? Uh, well, uh, one could uh, one one could say that uh, well, ba basically. The price in post-Keynesian economics depends on the unit cost to which is added a markup. And this markup will depend on several things. And different post-Keynesians disagree on uh, the most important factors that uh, have an impact on the markup. But certainly, the capital to output ratio will have uh, an impact. The, the target rate of return will have an impact on the markup, and then you know what determines the target rate of return? Is it the rate of interest? Is it the rate of growth of the company? Uh, so that's that's one way uh, of answering. Uh, and then on the other side, you have what what I call the the Sraffian strand of post-Keynesian economics, which to some extent is a critique of the Marxist uh, labor theory of value. Uh, so this trend recognizes that um, there is an interdependence between all the sectors, um, and, and that, of course, the prices in one sector will depend on the prices of the other sector. Uh, part of this Straffian strand is uh, Luigi Pazinetti, and I, uh, who is someone who is about 75 years old now. Uh, who was very much involved in those Cambridge controversies. And um, I mean, what, what Pazinetti says is that if you assume that the target rate of return of firms is exactly equal to the rate of growth of the firm, in this case, the price will be equal to the sum of the direct labor coefficient 
the indirect labor coefficient, meaning all the interdependent, uh, in all this interdependence coming from uh, the commodities that are used to produce commodities, and what he calls the hyper um, uh, the the hyper component of labor, which is the fact that <coughs> if you if you grow then you need to have more machines in the future and more capital in the future. So you need directly, you need directly labor to produce uh, your commodity. You, uh, you also need commodities to produce the, your commodity. So that's the indirect, indirect labor. And then you have this hyper indirect labor, which is uh, the fact that you need to produce machines for the sector to keep growing. So, uh, yeah, and I, I told Pazinetti, well, you, what you are, in fact, you are, the, you are the last defender of the theory of labor value, and he said yes. But it's a theory of labor value which is more sophisticated and I would say more coherent than the Marxist one. Uh, maybe I can link that to the fourth question. The question was about the production function and investment. Uh, there's no inc you know, incoherence here. I mean, as I said, the production function in neoclassical economics is simply saying that output is a function of labor and machines or capital. And uh, it has some features and characteristics. I mean, you learned that in first year, and all I'm saying is that and you have these substitution effects that come in, and all I'm saying is that, you know, you, you cannot use these regressions to uh, provide support for this neoclassical production function. I mean, I have nothing again. Of course, we need investment if we want to grow, but of course, but that, and also that's another issue. Ecological economists uh, would argue that we don't need to grow, we need degrowth. Uh, a bit related to that, there was a question on John Weeks. Uh, well, if you go back, I, I've told uh, Severin that he, he can distribute to any of you the PowerPoint if you want to, to have it. He can send it to you, I don't mind. Uh, and, and, and then you can go, you will see the, 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 the statement by uh, John Weeks. He doesn't talk about available resources. Uh, that's not in his, I mean, his, what he's saying is that, you know, we've, we've got to increase uh, production. Uh, if you also go back to the, the shape of the unit cost that I had when I presented the microeconomic view of the firm, uh, you'll see it's it's flat. So and, and firms are usually producing around 80% of capacity. So I think that in at least in the developed world, we can always produce more. It's not there's no scarcity in that sense. We almost all industries function at 70, 75, 80%, 85% of capacity. Most of the, the time we can produce more, but we don't produce more because there's not enough aggregate demand. Um, right, there was the question about econometrics and fundamental uncertainty. So this is certainly, uh, it's, 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 a, it, it's a part of the many issues where there are controversies among post-Keynesian economists. So for instance, Tony Lawson, who is uh, teaching at, uh, at the University of Cambridge is very, very skeptical of any use of econometrics for the reasons you just mentioned, fundamental uncertainty and all that. I, I, I don't take uh, this position. I, I mean, m all heterodox economists are aware that econometrics um, is, is a game it's a game that has to be played. It's a tool. It's a tool of rhetoric. I mean, if you try to convince somebody, econometrics is one of these rhetoric tools that can be used. Uh, and I agree that when we're dealing with time series, 
it, it can, I mean, you just change, one, you remove one observation or you change a time lag and you'll get completely different results. I completely agree with you. But there are other fields. I've done work on uh, the salaries of ice hockey players in the National Hockey League. And uh, there, I mean, it didn't matter whether we removed uh, an observation or uh, a variable, we were always getting the same results. So econometrics can be quite uh, good in some circumstances. In others, it is really soft empirical analysis. Uh, I think, uh, oh, oh yeah, and the last question was, is the crisis any different this time? Oh, I see a little sign here saying five minutes remaining. <laughs> uh, is, uh, is this crisis any, you know, different from previous ones? And I, I would say that very interestingly, it is very similar to the one we had back in 1990. 29, 1930. Uh, I mean, you, to some extent, you could say that the, you know, there were two important changes uh, in the 2000s that also occurred in the 1920s, which is that there was a big increase in income inequality. That's number one. And the second uh, thing is that there was also a big increase in the debt ratio. The debt to disposable income ratio of households in the United States uh, in, in, both, uh, in both time periods. So yeah, to some, uh, you know, everything is always a bit different from one crisis to another, but you, you had those two elements that were uh, very similar. And the third one, I think we could, third element which always appears, and that was uh, pointed out by John Kenneth Galbraith, is that you have when you are in the upswing, everybody believes he or she is really smart because he or she is making a lot of money. And, uh, and this is what happened in the 1920s and this is what happened now. So, you know, people take too much risk and so on. Right, so I'm waiting for right. well, uh, questions. Well, seeing as we've only got five minutes remaining, shall we, I don't know, shall we take one more question? Or yes. if there is one more question, no. Well, maybe, maybe we, I, I think there are other people out there waiting to get into this room. Yeah. So. All right. Um, Can we have a big round of applause? Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much and, and congratulations for having set up this group and uh, I hope it will keep on to be, I, I see there's a lot of people in the audience and I, I hope you will be able to uh, invite other lecturers either in person or uh, through audio conferences. Thank you. Best Thank of you. luck in your studies. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye bye. So, which one is Severin? Ask me. Several. All right. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Good.